the next few weeks, we're going to examine some questions concerning why we do things or why we believe certain things. A lot of, mis a lot of people have a lot of misunderstanding and uh, they have been misinformed about exactly what the Church of Christ is, what we believe, and why we believe what we believe. And so, in this short series, I want to try to answer some of the whys of why we do things or why we don't do other certain things that other churches do and try to give you a Bible answer for why we believe and practice the things that we do. This morning we're going to begin a lesson and hopefully finish it next Lord's Day on the subject of talking about my faith and your faith. We're talking about a standard of belief and it's been a very popular coined phrase for many many years that you need to just join the church of your choice. And so I want to ask a question. Why we believe that one faith is not as good as another? Is all faiths the same? Does it really matter what you believe? Does it really matter how you worship God? Does it really matter what one believes and what he practices in their faith? Does it really matter? Well, we want to examine the answer to that question this morning. I want to begin by explaining that there are many different types of faith. You know, on this chart you can see that there is a variety of different beliefs. We have the Roman Catholic Church, of course we have the Jewish faith, we have the Amish or the Mennonites, their really religion is a faith, then we have Islam, Buddhist, and then we have all types of denominations of different beliefs and different practices and different understandings. And all total, there are over 1,500 different types of beliefs and faith in our country alone. And so I want to ask the question, does it really matter? Or is choosing a faith no different than choosing the type of automobile that you drive? Does it really matter? It doesn't matter if you drive a Chevy or a Ford or a Lincoln or a Mazda or a Kia or a Honda really doesn't matter. Just one choice is as good as another as far as preference. If you prefer one car model over another, it really doesn't matter. It's up to a personal preference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, is that true with religion? Does God not mind and does it matter? And do all faith and do all beliefs, are they the same? And are they all serving the same God? And are they all acceptable to God? Well, we believe not. We believe the Bible clearly teaches that all faiths are not, as, not good and that one faith is not good as another. But we don't want you to take our word for it. We want to answer this question with God's word. Does God's word teach that one faith is as good as another? We believe that it teaches that it's not. Why do we believe that? We want to share that with you this morning. You see, there are different types of faith. You have the Baptist faith that was founded in the early 1600s, and they have various doctrines. Even within the Baptist church, there's 15 different sects of differing beliefs, even among themselves. Then you have the Church of the Latter-day Saints, referred to as the Mormon church, that began by Joseph Smith in Salt Lake City, Utah. And again, that is a they have their own set of beliefs. They even believe that they have a second inspired book the Book of Mormon, and they have their own prophets, they have their own band of apostles, and they have differing teaching that is only found in the Book of Mormon. And then, of course, you have the Christian church. It's made up of a lot of so-called Protestant faiths that believe a variety of doctrines and worship God in a variety of ways. And then you have the Methodists. The Methodists are really a branch off of the Roman Catholic Church during the Reformation period and they took a lot of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church but yet they modified them and changed them a little and it became known as the Methodist Church. And then you have the Jehovah Witness that began in the 1800s and the early 1900s and the Jehovah Witness believe that they are witnesses of God. They believe that the, they were going to live on the earth forever and they believed that the church started in 1914 and 
a host of variety of other things are premillennial in their thinking, but are, 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 they, are they just as good as any other church? Then you have, of course, you have the Lutheran church that was started by Martin Luther. And you have the Muslim faith that 25% of the world is Muslim, and it's one of the fastest growing religions, not just in our country, but in all the world. And so 25% of the world is Muslim. And then, of course, you have one billion Roman Catholics who believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's God on earth, and he has the same authority and delegated to him by the Father. And so you have different beliefs, and you have beliefs that are done by different practices. Now, none of these, and we could give many more, and these are just an example, but all of these differing beliefs have differing faiths. And so we have to wonder, and we have to ask, does it matter? Does it matter that we have differing faiths and differing beliefs? Does it matter to God? Is one belief as good as another? We believe the Bible will answer that in the negative, that one faith is not as good as another, but we want to examine and see what God's Word says in order to find our answer. Now, is one faith as good as another? Does it matter if you're Lutheran, if you're Baptist, if you're Methodist, if you're Islam, if you're Roman Catholic, if you're Jehovah Witness, if you're a Latter-day Saint, or if you're Christian, or if you're Jewish? Does it matter? Does it really matter? Is one faith as good as another? Let us answer the question. It's a very common concept. This is a very common concept that has been out for a very, very long time. One faith is as good as another. And it doesn't make any difference what one believes because we all serve the same God and we all believe in God and we all believe in the Son. And really the only thing that matters is that we would be sincere. That we would have sincerity in everything that we say and everything that we do. And we need to attend or join the church of your choice. You can see billboards that are on the highways that will say, join the church of your choice. Come and worship God today. Choose a church and go and see God's people. And they would, that sign and those advertisements would have you believe that all the churches are serving the same God and all are acceptable to God. But the question is, does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach that one faith is as good as another. That's what we're trying to find out. What does God's book say? What is God's answer on this question? Because that's the one that, that's the only one that really matters. It doesn't matter what my opinion is, nor what your opinion is. What does God's book say? Is one faith as good as another? And is this very common concept today, is it accepted and is it taught in the scripture? That is what we want to find out. This implies that differing beliefs, even though they're contradictory, even though they don't agree, even though they could be opposite, that it really doesn't matter. Even if the beliefs are contradictory, there are those within the Baptist Church, we'll give you an example, they believe that baptism is part of God's plan and is essential to salvation. There are others who believe that it's not. But all Baptists believe that once you become a Baptist or once you've been uh, accepted into the Baptist Church, then now you're in a covenant relationship with God, and yet that means that you can never be lost. It's called eternal security. And then you have differing doctrines. You have differing doctrines even within some organizations. And all the churches that I mentioned earlier, they have different doctrines. They have different teachings. Some believe in the premillennial theory, the thousand year reign on earth. Others believe that there's no hell. Others believe that there's going to be, the, the Jews are going to be God's chosen people and that all are going to have to convert to Judaism in order to be acceptable to God. And they believe there's going to be a great rapture when all the, the faithful are going to be taken off the earth. They're just a host of different doctrines out there and they're contradictory. That means they don't agree that one opposes to the other. Then you have different practices. You have many people who practice worshiping God in many different ways. You have a lot of churches that use the instrument. You have a lot of, you have some churches who worship on Saturday instead of Sunday. You have some churches that 
have the Lord's Supper, but maybe have it once a month, once a year, twice a year, only on so-called holy days, then you have those that don't, you don't have it at all because they don't believe that the kingdom is not here, and therefore they don't serve the Lord's Supper because they think they can't until the kingdom is established. And so you have differing practices, and they're contradictory. They don't agree. And then you have different churches, churches that were founded by different men, founded for different reasons. The Protestant movement that was a result of the Reformation period when men were opposing Roman Catholicism because they saw the inconsistency in Roman Catholicism and the evil in it, and that brought the birth of many, many different denominations. That was really the beginning of denominations and the Protestant faith, so-called. And so they have different churches. But really doesn't matter. He is choosing a church and choosing a belief and a doctrine and a practice no different than the kind of flavor of ice cream you like or the kind of car that you drive or the type of house that you buy. Does it not really matter? Is it all just a matter of choice? Well, what does God's book say? If one faith is good as another, we need to know the answer to that, and God's book will give us the answer. First of all, are all faiths the same? Are all faiths basically the same? Whether you're talking about the Lutherans, or the Methodists, or the Presbyterians, or the Mormons, or the Islam, or the Christian faith, or the Jews, or the Roman Catholics, are all faiths equal? And the answer to that is no. They are not equal. The Bible says there is one faith. Now when it says one faith, it means one standard of truth. There is only one rule book. There is only one standard of faith, and it is contained in the Bible. The Bible speaks of one faith, not many faiths. Very plain, not hard to understand. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through you all, and in you all. Notice in Ephesians chapter 4, there is one faith. There is not a plural here. It doesn't say many faiths. It says one faith. How many is one? That's one more than zero, and one less than two. There is only one one faith. This book was written by the inspiration of God. It's God's mind being revealed to man, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, and this is God revealing his desires to his creation, and he says that there is only one faith. There's just one. The Bible says there's one. There's not 1,500. There's only one Bible faith. One. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not Church of Christ doctrine. That's not my interpretation. That comes right from God's Word from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 5. It says that there is one faith. Singular. Just one true biblical faith. And what faith means only one faith. It doesn't mean a plurality. It means one faith, one spirit. How many spirits are there? How many Holy Spirits are there? Well, we know there's only one. There's only one spirit in the Godhead. Well, how many Lords do we have? How many Saviors do we have? How many people died for our sin? We know the answer to that. There's only one. There's only one Lord. There's only one Savior. And how many gods are there? Well, that depends on who you ask. In in the Buddhist religion, there are over 330 million different gods, things that are gods. But the Bible says there is only one true and living God. And so there is only one. And the Bible says that there is only one faith. Now, why is it, ladies and gentlemen, that we understand that there's only one spirit, and we understand there's only one Lord, and we understand that there's only one God, but yet when we get to the faith, then we have difficulty and we do not understand that there is only one faith. There is only one. If there is one spirit, 
and one God, and there is one Lord, there also is only one faith. If these three are true, and we know that they are, it's only three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we understand that, why do we not understand that there is only one faith? Not plurality, not many, just one. One biblical faith. This is the context of unity. In order to have unity, we have to have one faith. Look again in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read the context of what 4 and 6 were found by reading the first three verses above it. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling on which you were called. That word walk there means manner of life. And we are to have a manner of life that's worthy of the calling by which we were called, and we were called by the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. This is talking about character. We are to be lowly minded. We are to be humble. We are to be gentle and kind. We are to be long suffering. And we are to be forbearing with one another. And we are to love one another. The Bible gives us those characteristics in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. 23 through 25. And it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how do we keep unity? Now, unity cannot be achieved without truth. Now, many people believe that it can be, but that's a false sense of unity. I'll give you an example. Today, we have the community church. The community church, or the mega church, as sometimes they're called, are made up of many different faiths, people from all different types of religious backgrounds and beliefs and practices. And yet they all come together under one roof and they claim that they have spiritual unity. No, they're just under the same roof. They don't have any unity because they have differing beliefs, differing practices, different doctrines. They do not have biblical unity because biblical unity cannot be achieved without truth. But, you know, God gave us the formula for biblical unity. We just read it in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians chapter 4. How do we keep the unity of the Spirit? By there being one body, one Spirit, one Lord, one hope, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. Those seven ones make up the pillars of unity. Those seven ones are the pillars of unity. If we're going to keep unity, true biblical unity, then we're going to have to have those seven ones. And if we have those seven ones, one of those ones is that there is only one faith. Again, not a plurality, just one. And so, what we see, one faith is essential to unity. Unity cannot be achieved. True biblical unity cannot be achieved cannot be realized without belonging to the one faith. Many faiths create division. You have no unity when you have many faiths. The, the example I just gave you, the mega churches or the community church, where you have many different faiths, many different practices, many different doctrines, under one roof, how is there unity there? There's no unity. There's no basic unified understanding. Oh, they would tell you, oh, we all believe in God. We all believe in the Son. That may be so, but you do not have the same practices. You do not have even the same worship. You don't even believe the same teachings. Then how do you have unity? No, ladies and gentlemen, that type of unity creates division. And that's something that God hates. God desires unity. But to have unity, you have to have and be part of a one faith revealed in Scripture. Not according to what you think or I think, but according to the Scripture. Does the Scripture give us the definition and give us enough information to be able to identify the one true faith? And the answer is yes. All we have to do is open our Bible and open our mind and we can find the answer. There is only one faith. Now, I know that's not popular. I know that many people think that's narrow, 
But I didn't originate it. I didn't write the Bible. The Bible is God's Word. I just believe what the Bible says. I've just told you what the Bible says. Now, you don't have to accept that. You can accept somebody else's interpretation of it, and you can accept somebody telling you that it doesn't mean what it says. That's your prerogative. But if you want to know what God's Word says, He said, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Son, who has all authority in heaven and earth, He said there is only one faith. Therefore, that's all we preach, and that's all we believe, is that there is one faith. And number two, one can be religious, and they can be wrong. Do you realize one may be very religious, he may be very devout, he may have much reverence and love for God, he can be very pious, but yet he can be religiously wrong. It is possible. How do we know? Well, let's see how we know. Cain offered was not acceptable. He offered a sacrifice that was not acceptable. He was religious. He offered the best that he had. He offered the fruit of the ground, the best that he, he produced, the best that he harvested. But God did not respect his sacrifice. Notice Genesis 4. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Notice he did not respect Cain's offering. He offered it out of love. He offered it sincerity. He offered the best that he had. But God did not accept it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you, you have to consider why. Why did he not accept his sacrifice? Well, we know why, because Abel offered his by faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 4. We know why he didn't. You see, the Lord respected the offering of the firstborn of his flock, but he didn't respect the offering of the fruit of the ground. The Lord respected one, and he rejected the other. He rejected Cain, but he accepted Abel. Now, is God showing partiality? No. We know the reason that that is, is in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. I ask you to take your Bible and turn to Hebrews 11, verse 4, and we can understand why Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. In verse 11, sometimes called the roll call of the faithful, verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though he being dead, still speaks. Notice, Abel offered to God by faith. What does it mean by faith? That means by instruction. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This was not a faith. Cain offered what he thought would be acceptable. He offered a substitute. It was not by faith. It was not by God's word. It was by his own choosing, and but God did not receive it. Why? because it wasn't according to faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God's instruction must be followed in order for God to respect the offering. And so it is possible that you could make a religious offering to God, and yet if it's not by faith, it's not according to God's authority, nor by His Word, He will not receive it, and He will not accept it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's what is taught by the example of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, that not all worship is acceptable to God if it is not offered by faith. Nadab and Abihu sacrifice did not please God in Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire on, in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire, the other translations say strange fire, perverse fire, before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord, and he devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now these are two, two priests who were in the tabernacle to offer worship to God, and they were struck dead from heaven with fire because they offered a fire which God had not commanded them. Now all faith is good as another? And all practices as good as another? If so, why did Cain and Abel lose their life 
when they offered something that was strange or profane or perverted, something that God had not commanded them. They were offering worship, but God did not accept it. Why? Because it was not according to his instruction. Offered unauthorized fire. The NIV says they offered an unauthorized fire, something that wasn't authorized by God. Therefore, he did not receive it. He rejected it. And so, this demonstrates that it does matter how a person will worship God. Now, in clothing this morning, we need to remember that if one religion, one can be religious and can be wrong. Cain was wrong. Cain offered a sacrifice and he substituted what God said. God rejected that. And if you read Genesis 4 verse 6, it says that he rejected it. Why? Because it was sin. It was sin lying at the door. If he did well, God told Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? He wasn't accepted. Why? Because he didn't do well. Why didn't he do well? Because he didn't follow the instruction. Abel offered his by faith according to Hebrews 11.4. Therefore, his was accepted. Therefore, a man can offer something religiously, even with good intention, even offer the best that they have, and yet it can be rejected. And then last, we looked at Nadab and Abihu, who were priests in their garments, offering worship to God in the tabernacle, when after they were consecrated, and God sent fire from heaven and devoured them, because they offered profane fire, which God had not commanded them. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing this morning, we need to be very, very serious about what it means to change God's rules, to change what God says. Now, you have that prerogative. You can change anything the Bible says. You can reject anything it teaches. And you can deny the, the teachings that are contained in the Scripture. You have a right to do all of that. But, remember this. You also must receive and accept the consequences of your decision. And the consequence of that decision is that whatever you offer to God, no matter how sincere, no matter how much you love Him, no matter how much you respect Him, if it's not according to His will, then it will not be accepted. And so we go back to what we asked in the beginning. It doesn't matter what one believes. If one belief is good as another, the world says yes. I'm, going, I'm trying to show you through God's Word that the answer to that is no. That one belief is not as good as another.